said, I am the science communication intern uh, this summer at the Urban Ecology Center, and I've sat through many wonderful backyard lectures, lectures and now it's my turn. Now you get to listen to me. <laughs> so, um, I, um, yeah, I'll be talking about um, community science, monarch larvae, and uh, some really gnarly parasitoids, which I'm really excited about. Uh, so there it goes. Um, I thought I'd start with kind of a soothing video before we get to the, the creepier pictures, if you, if you find that kind of thing creepy. Um, so this is kind of just some general context or a refresher about the monarch life cycle. Uh, and this is actually a video that was um, filmed in Wisconsin, which is pretty cool. Um, it, there's some kind of erratic music choices, so I'm just going to mute it and just talk um, over uh, this video, which just shows the life cycle from egg to butterfly. Um, also some cool cloud shots. <laughs> um, All right, here we go. So yeah, this is somewhere in Wisconsin, um, and these are um, common milkweed plants. I'll talk a bit more about why um, butterflies or monarchs lay their eggs on milkweed, but so cute. And so we like to say that this is, um, the eggs are about the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen. So they're really tiny, oh, they're so cute. Um, and then they hatch these tiny little larvae, um, which, um, are like, we like to say they're like the size of a mechanical pencil. So lots of writing utensil uh, metaphors and then they, they eat their eggshells um, and then grow up on the milkweed plants. Uh, we, a lot of uh, larval stages of um, insects are referred to as first through fifth instar. That's the different developmental stages of the larva. So this would be um, a fifth instar. Uh, it's about to form a pupa. We haven't seen any pupae at the, or we call you center this summer, but it's pretty cool looking. We know they are around because um, we've seen lots of adult monarchs. So cool. And then out of the goop that that caterpillar turns into, we get a beautiful adult monarch butterfly um, emerging from the chrysalis. Um, and that is oh, it's so cool. I'm so you look at it. So that's the, the video just goes from um, the egg hatching to the adult just merging, merging from the chrysalis, but for uh, for adult monarchs, that's just the beginning, especially um, the, what we think is the current generation that has been hatching, which were, um, is referred to as the super generation. This is the generation that um, uh, follows several generations that are um, born throughout the summer. And this generation, the one that makes the famous migration down to Mexico, where we get, oh, where we get, There we go. Uh, where we get scenes like this, um, which I would love to see one day. Um, just so beautiful. Um, they even um, have been uh, recorded returning to the trees in Mexico that their direct ancestors um, like migrated to uh, years ago, which is very cool. And no one knows how or why. It's something that we're still figuring out. Uh, and we get to spend an hour talking about monarch ecology this morning. So what a what a way to start Friday. Um, so I'll let you let you look at this beautiful picture for a few more moments. Um, but at the Urban Ecology Center, what learning about monarchs means um, on a much smaller, closer to home scale is um, egg and larva surveys, um, which we've been conducting at all three of our branches between. May and August for many years. Uh, so we do one per week at each, each of the three branches. Here's a couple of our um, outdoor leaders from uh, this summer uh, who, who are high school interns looking at a red milkweed beetle that we found on a plant during one of these surveys. They were a big help this, this summer, the, in, the interns, also the, the milkweed beetles. Uh, and 
here's a really cute little like between second and third instar that we found also at Menominee Valley. Uh, that was our most fruitful branch this summer. Uh, just saying good morning to you uh, on some milkweed. Um, and we, we check a minimum of 100 plants each week, week, each week at each branch. And what we record what we find, um, whether or not we found any evidence of monarchs on each plant, we still record uh, that we check that plant and we send it to um, this initiative called the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, um, which was founded at the University of Minnesota by researchers in 1997. Um, and today is also affiliated with uh, the UW-Madison Arboretum. Um, so that's where we are reporting our findings to. Um, so for the past 25 years, um, the MLMP, which is how I'll refer to the, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project has become this massive online database of information about monarch populations and migration trends. So the goal is really just to collect as much spatial and temporal data as possible um, about monarchs. Um, and that can be utilized uh, by researchers, all this data that's been amassed over the past uh, the past quarter century. Um, and in North and Central America, as well as New Zealand, um, there are 1,200 uh, uh, monarch larva monitoring sites registered total. Um, and it goes without saying that this would simply not be possible without um, just one team of researchers at the uh, University of Minnesota or like even all the entomologists in the United States uh, or in, the, the, in North America. Um, this is an initiative that is only made possible because of community scientists. Um, so community scientists uh, are those who contribute to research in a scientific field in which they don't have formal training. And they include all of our wonderful volunteers who come to monarch surveys and all of our research surveys every, every week, um, whose dedication is just so inspiring to me because we have all of these, these data. Um, just because of all these people who are dedicating their free time just to advancing scientific understanding for just for the, the gain of uh, the greater the greater good, <laughs> the greater um, scientific understanding. Um, and I just think that is so cool. Um, just just for the 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 ability to, to advance scientific knowledge is why, why all of these volunteers are coming out um, and, and to educate themselves as well. A quick note, you might have also heard community scientists referred to as citizen scientists. Um, and a lot of organizations are kind of making the switch, making the shift over to calling them community scientists instead. Um, and a lot of that is just because um, you don't have to be a citizen of anywhere to participate in community scientists in science. You just have to be part of the community. We all are. So anyone can be a community scientist, anyone on the planet. Um, and there are some skeptics who say that, you know, data that are collected by untrained folks are less um, verifiable. Um, but I, I have a lot of confidence, especially in the MLMP, because um, the data, the data collecting sheets and the, the methodology is just so, uh, so specific and detailed and just is made so accessible. Um, so here's a data sheet from a particularly fruitful survey um, at Menominee Valley a few weeks ago. Um, and you can see that we, we've collected a lot of information about time and temperature and all this um, like additional information that'll go into this database. And then we've also been tallying how many plants we, um, how many plants we checked total, uh, including plants that had zero monarchs um, and then uh, for each plant with one monarch, two monarchs, and et cetera. Um, we've been recording whether we found eggs or um, looks like we found lots of, oh, first, second, and third instars um, on this day. And then um, we're recording what we found on each plant. Um, and we would also fill this part out. Um, uh, it's also, I wanna acknowledge that a lot of that skepticism about uh, the validity of uh, community science data does uh, tend to ignore the, the barriers to obtaining scientific training for a lot of people. Um, and I think there are some folks out there who would rather that the scientific knowledge remains in the hands or in the minds of people who don't have those barriers to obtaining scientific training. So I just wanna reiterate that 
new science is for everyone. And I, uh, I'm just so, so happy to see all the volunteers who've been coming up this summer um, and just being willing to learn. Um, so thanks to those community scientists. Um, if you follow this, this path um, on the website at the bottom of the screen, you can find um, uh, all of these papers that have been written utilizing data that's been collected through the MLMP for the past 25 years. Um, all this crowdsourced data, and I'm gonna focus on one paper in particular today. Uh, I'm gonna let my little on our fly to it, there he goes. Um, so uh, I chose to focus on this paper because it's cool and recent, uh, but also fun coincidence. Um, when I was looking at these papers, I, um, I noticed that um, I recognized one of the names and Dana Elmquist uh, is a former, um, former employee at the Monarch Lab. Um, in Minnesota, but he's actually currently getting his PhD in my dad's lab in at the University of Idaho. So it was a fun, fun little overlap. And um, Dean was kind enough to chat with me for a blog post um, recently as well, and um, decided to kind of turn that into this lecture as well. Um, so we're gonna, for a little bit more context, we're gonna talk about monarchs and their predators. Um, so this is, oh. We have a quick question, um, uh, kind of towards the beginning of the, the first part of the lecture. What is the difference between a first and a second install? Yeah, I, um, I'm realizing maybe I should have included a, a whole uh, chart. Maybe at the end of the, the presentation, I can find a picture and pull it up that shows um, all the different stages. Um, but, I think one thing that we see um, with each in star stage is that they're, the stripes are a little bit more defined. Uh, they're just getting bigger and they're growing their, their antennae as well. Um, so I think, yeah, if I were to um, be deciding whether a particular monarch larva was a first or second in star, I think size would be a big thing. And then I would also look at how define their stripes were. So if it's teeny, but it has pretty, pretty distinct stripes and it's starting to grow in penny, I would say it's a second in star. Would you, would you agree with that, Maggie? And blog link. Um, yeah, Mitch, I don't know if your question is regarding just the difference in general between the in stars or the specific field marks between the first and second in stars. Um, but yeah, the, the first instar is is um, very, very small and gray, kind of how Claire mentioned. Um, it's about the size of a lead of a mechanical pencil and it kind of looks like that color too. Um, and then as they move into their second instar, they get faint, faint lines, a little bit darker lines. Um, and yeah, their antennae and legs move a bit, but... Um, uh, on. The, yeah, so the E, maybe it wasn't clear about clear enough about that, but the, um, the E um, on the log uh, stands for egg. Um, and then, yeah, and then first through third, and we can also record fourth and fifth in stars, but I don't think we found any that day. Um, if you see one of those, it refers to a larva or caterpillar that we found. So yeah, I'll, I'll try to be a little better about keeping my eye on the chat and, and answering any questions that pop up, but um, I hope, hope that answered it. We can, yeah, we can go back and, and look at the, the log, let the little butterfly fly away. Uh, okay, uh, but yeah, so if you see an E that refers to one egg that we found, if it says two monitors per plant and there's two E's, that means we found two eggs on the plant. And then here uh, we found two eggs on one plant and then on the same plant, we also found two second instars and one third instar. Uh, so that's that's how we keep track of the data. Our, our butterfly is gonna fly back, <laughs> back to our, uh, our paper that we're focusing on. Um, so uh, this is common milkweed. Um, 
which is, I'm sure you've all seen by the side of the road and at the Urban Ecology Center and everywhere in this part of Wisconsin. Um, so monarchs only lay their eggs on milkweed, any species of milkweed, but this is, uh, this is the one that we checked during our, our surveys at the UC. Um, and they do that because uh, there's a toxin, there are toxins in the sap um, that they're able to metabolize and they incorporate those into their tissue, which is pretty neat. So um, it is toxic if it's, it's digested in, in large quantities and can cause heart failure in the, the animals that eat them. Um, but at a small dose, it just tastes bad and kind of causes indigestion. So some of you might have seen this famous series of a, a blue jay um, trying to eat a monarch um, and then having an experience that is going to prevent it from ever trying to eat a monarch again. Um, we've all been there. So it's um, uh, the blue jay is going to be okay, but it's not going to try to eat another monarch. Uh, and if it did, it would not be okay. <laughs> um, a cool side note for our birders um, in the in the call, uh, there's two species of birds that have evolved to digest monarchs, or at least parts of monarchs, um, and that's the black-backed oriole and the black-headed grosbeak. Um, and then also one group of fox squirrels in California has learned how to um, eat the parts of the monarch that don't um, don't cause indigestion or aren't toxic, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and another big group that can consume monarchs is uh, parasitoids. So I'll give you a brief intro to this group. Um, and uh, we have our, our resident um, parasite expert in the house, Amanda. So if you if there's anything you think should should supplement this slide, go ahead and shout it out, Amanda. But um, parasites um, can be any any organism on Earth, and you can parasitize any organism on earth by um, deriving nutrients to the detriment of their host that they're living in or on. But by definition, as I understand it, they don't directly kill their host. So hosts can often die from reasons related to being parasitized, like um, not, not getting enough nutrients, um, but they're never directly killed by their parasites. Um, and then parasitoids, I have heard described as kind of being on the continuum between a predator and a parasite. So um, they are like parasites, always smaller than their hosts, but they, they stick out in a few ways. The first is that they only are insects. So um, wasps, flies, and nematodes, so some worms are, are parasitoids as well. Um, and they live the full, as, as flies and wasps, they live the full life cycle of, um, of these insects and only during the larval stage are they parasitic. So um, they lay their eggs uh, in or on a host and um, the larvae live inside of the host. Um, and that's the, the only point during their life cycle that they are parasitic. Um, and then um, after their larval stage or at the end of their larval stage, um, they emerge from the host, which kills it. Um, and they're a massive, um, group of creatures. Um, in one particular family of parasitic wasps, there are 80,000 different species. Um, and to put that in perspective, there's only 64,000 species of vertebrates on the planet. So massive, massive group of, of um, insects or of creatures of animals. Um, many of them are insects. Uh, and I don't know if there's anyone in this group who's maybe a little squeamish, but um, we're gonna look at some photos now. So now if that describes you is a, is a good time to maybe go, go refill your coffee, maybe just, you know, look out at the sun and then just come out back in a few minutes, but we're gonna, we're gonna get into the, into the gnarly photos now. Um, so we're, we're getting right into it. Parasites are, better known than uh, parasitoids because they affect people and we tend to focus on, on learning about things that affect us like this tapeworm. Uh, so in other words, you don't have to worry about parasitoids. They don't, they don't um, use humans as hosts. Um, ticks are also parasitoids uh, and so are lice like this tongue eating louse that you, you may have seen photos of before. It uh, eats the tongue of certain species of fish and then replaces it inside of their mouth. Um, and 
some barnacles are also parasitic. So this is a photo of a crab that's being parasitized by a barnacle right here. I don't know if you can see my map, um, but it's pretty, pretty obvious <laughs> where it is. Um, and then moving to parasitoids, um, these are aphids that have been, uh, the, this wasp was a parasitoid of these aphids and uh, entomologists call these mummy aphids because um, they kind of like dry out and turn into husks while the, the parasitoid larva, larvae are living inside of them and then they break out through, through these holes in their backs. Um, we're also gonna talk about zombies. Uh, some parasitoids um, can control the minds of the insects that they are using as a host. Um, like uh, there's some, some fungi that do this as well. So this is a, a caterpillar um, that has already served as a host and um, now it's, it's hanging out by uh, these pupae of, I think I believe it's a fly and it is um, attacking any predators of the fly that, um, that come near. And that's the only thing, that's the only thing it's gonna do until it starves to death. It's, um, once it's been used to host, that's some, some switch in his brain is just thrashing at the, any predators that approach these pupae and that's going to be its purpose for the rest of its life. Um, also, um, there have been some examples observed of hyperparasitoids. Um, so this is a wasp that is laying eggs in the larvae of another parasitoid that's already inside of a mummy aphid. Um, and then uh, we got the stars of our show. Um, these are uh, decanid flies and they have just emerged from a monarch chrysalis uh, that, or a pupa that they were um, using as a host. Uh, and this is, this is who we're gonna focus on um, for, for the rest of the, the lecture. So um, if any of this seems like something out of a horror movie to you, you are not the first person to think that. Um, I chose one of the less gory shots in this scene because I didn't know if every, everyone here was a, a horror nut, but this is a very famous scene from the movie Alien. Um, and uh, maybe earlier in this lecture, you were just thinking about some Oscar winning social commentary. So that is to say, um, either way, way, these guys have certainly entered the popular imagination. They uh, really, uh, there's a lot of parasitic and or parasite and parasitoid um, inspo in, in horror movies um, and non-horror movies. They're just, we just, we love to think about them. Um, so we've got mummies, zombies, and aliens in one backyard lect naturalist lecture. I don't know if you were prepared for that this morning, but um, I love to say, I've been saying it all summer, that there's just nothing stranger that anyone's been able to come up with in science fiction or fantasy um, that like nothing, there's nothing stranger than what we already have on earth. We just, we've never been able to do it. Um, we already have all this um, in the world. Um, oh, hold on. Um, okay. um, I do wanna emphasize that while um, it's fun to talk about how creepy these insects are or these, these creatures um, and it's normal to react to them that way, uh, they are, essential to the ecosystem. Um, I heard someone say that the, we have parasitoids to thank for the fact that when you look outside, the world is green. You can see green because they parasitize, or yeah, the parasites are the use hosts um, that are herbivorous insects. And without them, we would just not, we would not be able to keep those insects in check or um, plants, I guess, would not be able to keep those insects in check. Um, so it would just, it would just be a brown world without parasitoids. Um, and, uh, you know, many of them are, are native, the kinid flies are native. Um, and there's nothing, I don't want to imply that there's anything inherently bad about any of these creatures. Um, you know, they're just doing what they, they evolved to do, even, even tapeworms and ticks. And I think that's pretty cool, but, uh, it's okay if you find them a little creepy. Um, um, I, 
um, want to talk now more about Dickin and Fly specifically. And um, I thought I would turn it over to Dane. This is just a little clip from a webinar he gave um, a few years ago. Um, and it's just another person talking uh, behind um, a, a slide. So there's no, no fun animation or anything, but um, I just thought I would let an expert explain to you the life cycle. It's just cool to hear him talk about it. Oh. Um, about the Dekinid life cycle. So you got uh, an idea of the parasitoid life from Carl's previous presentation, um, but there are some pretty unique qualities um, that Dekinids exhibit. So I'll just touch on those a little bit right here. So this first picture is of a, an adult Dekinid fly. Most Dekinids are larger than your average house fly and noticeably more bristly, as you can see right here. Um, I've actually read about them uh, affectionately referred to as the bristle butt family. Um, so across the family, there's a large variety of shapes, colors, sizes, and types of bristling. And uh, we'll see another picture later on here that'll uh, show that a little better. Um, Tachinids have a global distribution. Um, they're most diverse in the tropics, and part of the reason for their success at inhabiting a variety of habitats across the globe is their parasitoid life strategy. Female tachinids possess many strategies for parasitizing an unsuspecting caterpillar peacefully munching away on its milkweed. Sometimes females will seek out a caterpillar host and lay her eggs on the host. Um, sometimes they'll actually inject eggs inside the host. And even um, sometimes females will search for specific habitats, like uh, a plant species, um, in hopes of finding a host there. So they've got some pretty amazing strategies for actually parasitizing their hosts. Um, they have equally amazing strategies for actually seeking out these hosts. Um, as we discussed above, they have a variety of oviposition or egg laying strategies. Um, and some hosts even pick up on olfactory cues uh, called volatiles, which are given off um, by plants that a host caterpillar is feeding upon. So they're actually sensing cues from the plants to find their host. Pretty cool. Um, other tachinids search out a host's food source or even the burrow of a hidden host and conveniently lay their eggs there. Some hosts are, uh, excuse me, some tachinids are even able to recognize host pheromones, um, which hosts would use to, host caterpillars use pheromones to communicate with each other. Um, and these tachinids are able to recognize those pheromones of those hosts and actually use that as a host finding ability. Um, so they can be pretty nefarious in the ways that they seek out their hosts. Um, as you can probably tell, there are a ton of different strategies used by tachinid flies. So once the uh, egg, um, or the larvae is inside the host, they um, you know, undergo that parasitoid lifestyle, eating the host from the inside out before they eventually um, need to leave their host and pupate. Usually they leave the host and pupate on the ground or uh, in the soil. Um, some species of Dekinidae, as you can see in this picture, actually will eject themselves from the host um, and they come out on these long strings that you might be able to see here that are called gelatinous tendrils. They'll fall to the ground, um, here's an example of some tachinids that have just emerged from this um, monarch chrysalis here. So they fall to the ground and then they'll pupate safely in the soil and the whole process will begin again. All right, thanks Dane. Um, this is just a little, a little summary from an expert of uh, the tachinid fly um, life cycle. Um, so, First of all, I want to share this, this little anecdote. When I was talking to Dane, he told me that the reason that they um, decided to write this paper is because at the Monarch Lab in Minnesota, they um, needed some freezer space and were kind of trying to clear some out and they found all of these decanted fly uh, samples that had been mailed in to mem uh, participants in the MLMP uh, for, since 1997. Uh, some people who participate in, in this initiative um, actually take caterpillars or, or eggs when they find them and rear them in their homes and observe them. And sometimes they would get these emerging flies. Um, they had um, like thousands of samples that had been mailed in and just kind of had been like sequestered in a freezer. And they, they were like, oh, we need this space. We might as well do something with all of these. And then they, they found all these cool things and got to write this paper. So. Uh, I just thought that was fun, but um, 
so um, the paper identified seven species of Tachinidae, which is a family uh, that includes uh, thousands of species. Um, this is, so the, all, the, all the species are, are Tachinid flies or Tachinid flies. Um, and um, the identification, as you can imagine, if there's 20,000 species or up to 20,000 species in this family uh, often comes down to some really specific details. So there, there are a couple of kid experts um, in the US um, who, who they got on board and um, sometimes identification of a species came down to like the length of one hair on a thorax. So really, really specific details. Um, so um, of all of these, um, these samples in these freezers, they identified seven total species, including one that they had never identified before, um, and that that was they dubbed it. Um, I'm going to try it, Leshenaltia. Um, so um, they were they were able to uh, to discover and name a new species. Um, they also identified uh, dicanid flies as the primary monarch parasitoids. So there are other parasitoids that do um, use monarchs as hosts, but uh, dicanids are the, the overwhelming majority of the, um, or at least the majority of the, of the um, parasitoids that you'll find um, on and in um, the, the monarch larvae and, and uh, pupae. Um, they also confirmed that, like other parasitoids, tachinid flies are fatal for their host caterpillars. So once they emerge, the um, they are killing their their host caterpillars. And um, they um, they also determined that um, a little less than ten percent of all monarch larvae become host to tachinid fly larva uh, or larvae. Um, and um, this paper also identified the first case of multiparasitism in this family, which means more than one species emerging from one caterpillar or one pupa, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and they also determined that there are some decayed species that specialize in parasitizing monarchs, so they have evolved to specifically parasitize, uh, parasitize monarchs. Uh, whereas there are some species of tachinid flies that also parasitize other caterpillars and other insects. Um, so lots of very cool findings just from um, needing some more freezer space. Um, and it was all, all thanks to community scientists. Um, I see that- another question. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, is there a predator or parasitoid that will destroy the tachinid fly? Sorry for my pronunciation. Oh, no, no worries. Um, that is a great question, and I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, I would say it's um, it's very possible that um, uh, tachinid flies have their own parasitoids, uh, or something that I'm sure there's something that eats them as adults. Uh, but I'm not sure exactly exactly who their predators are, and then um, do they spread from one monarch larva to another? So um, they're going to lay their eggs on the the larva once they're adults. Um, and then the, the eggs and the larvae are gonna live exclusively inside of that, that caterpillar to, to my knowledge. Um, but you know, I'm sure if there's a larva or a monarch population and a tachinid fly population in one area, there, you're gonna see a lot, of, um, a lot of close family members parasitizing the same, the same group of, of monarchs. Um, but I don't think that you'll see a larva. I mean, uh, the larva is gonna live inside of one caterpillar until it emerges, so it's not going to spread to a, to another caterpillar once it's um, once it's parasitized a particular larva. Um, so again, this is all possible because of community science. It just wouldn't have been possible if it was just this team of researchers. Um, so I just want to reiterate the importance of community science and how much. I love it. Uh, here's a cute picture of Maggie um, doing the MLMP with a couple of very young community scientists. Uh, so I'm getting started young. Um, and um, I want to note that um, 
the International Union for the Conservation of Nature uh, about a month ago on July 21st, um, uh, officially has started listing um, monarchs as endangered. So I think the, the work we're doing here is more important than ever. Um, and just to determine just the more we know about monarchs and their, their migratory patterns and their populations, the more we can do to help them. Um, and it, it's worth it because we come there. And, and they're also really important, of course, to the, the um, ecosystem because they're, they're pollinators and they're just, um, you know, they're hosts for parasitoids that makes them important to the ecosystem. Um, so uh, we, gotta, we gotta make sure we're, we're retaining these, these beautiful creatures. Um, again, the fact that they have parasitoids, um, you know, is not something we're trying to stop, even though we want to make sure that, um, that we, um, we retain this population, but, um, you know, it is very possible that climate change and other, um, other impacts of human activity are affecting, like, the rates of parasitism of monarchs. Um, that's something that there's not a lot of research on yet. Uh, but you know, is it possible that um, that human activity, and climate change, and parasitism um, in the, in this particular uh, family um, of flies will um, end up sort of coming into play? And if we do find out some more about that, we will only be able to find out, as always, with um, with the help of community scientists. So again, I just want to thank thank you to everyone who has who's come out on any any work community science surveys this summer. Um, and that's what I've got for you. Thank you. And I'll take, I'll take any additional questions. Um, 